Good, Ed. Hey, Drew. Good to talk to you today. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate this invitation. I was wondering, we've, we've spent some time together talking about race and racism, but I was just thinking that I haven't heard a lot of stories from your childhood growing up. Do you have any experiences or, or things that formed your idea of racism from that age? Yes, I do. Um, the first was when I was about nine or 10 years old, I took a bus trip. I felt grown up. My mom put me on the bus and I got to drive down to uh, ride on a bus to visit my aunt in T Tampa. And on the way, we stopped at a Georgia rest stop and there were two little restaurants side by side. One of them had a gumball machine and I had just the, a quarter in my pocket to get a gumball and that's all I wanted. So I went to the one that had a gumball machine, went straight to the gumball machine, got the gumball, and then started looking around me and feeling kind of foolish because I was the only white person there. And the African-Americans that were there were all smiling at me and not laughing at me, but, but good nature, like this kid doesn't know what he's doing. And they were right. I didn't. I didn't have any understanding that I was living in such a racially divided world. And, um, and I did not go on the white side. I just went back on the bus because I was kind of frustrated and bummed out about that. So that's my first experience of race. Wow. Racism. Wow. Um, when, when I was a pastor, I was meeting with a group of other white Lutheran pastors who were, you know, in pretty significantly larger churches and, and we had a good relationship and we wanted to study a book about why the 11 o'clock hour is the most racially segregated hour in our country. And so we said, well, why don't you invite one of your black pastor friends and why don't you invite one of yours? And so we started talking about who to invite to study, do into a book study. And we all felt kind of foolish and sheepish because none of us could name a single African-American friend that we knew by name who we knew well enough to invite to come do a book study. So after we admitted that to each other, we said, let's get someone to help us. So we invited, we got called an African-American friend who hosted a lunch and we got there and presented the book and said what we wanted to do. And I'll never forget the guy who stood up and said, look, if all you want to do is a dog and pony show, I'm not interested. But if you're really wanting a book study because you'd like to form friendships and honest relationships across racial lines and maybe meeting each other's homes and even get to know each other's families, sign me up. I'm in. And we did that for five years. We called it a race and reconciliation group. And that's when I learned so much from these African-American men who shared with me and opened up with me and were honest with me. And that, that was one of the most growing experiences I've had in my life. So what about some things that uh, you remember when you were growing up? I can think of one story, which I'm not even sure that I, it would even ring a bell for you and mom. But I remember being in kindergarten. I think I've been sent to the principal's office one time in my life. And it was in kindergarten. And I got in a fight with another boy. He was black in my class. And I remember the indignation that I felt at being sent to the principal's office next to him because I had in my mind, I should not be the one being sent to the principal's office, but he should. And there was no message that you ever sent me that, that led me to that conclusion. It was just something that was ingrained in me. And, and I remember that really well to this day. And I remember the messages that you sent. I mean, we grew up, I grew up in South Carolina in a very racially charged place. And yet for most of my life and childhood, I did not think much about racism. And the message I received from you and mom was that to not, to not see racism is to, to treat everyone the same, regardless of color. That was a, that was the virtue. And I, I feel like I mostly did that through, uh, through, elementary, middle, and high school um, in being part of large African-American schools in a lot of ways, but but it's still, I don't even think I realized how prevalent racism was, even though it was all around me so much. Is that, do you think that's the message that you and mom were trying to send to me and, and my sisters growing up? Yeah, I think treating everyone equally was certainly the message we wanted to sing and to love and care for, see everyone as your neighbor, I think at times we might have even made the mistake of saying be colorblind. And that is not a right thing to say because being colorblind means don't notice any difference. And so uh, I think one of the things I've grown more is to realize that color matters, but not as a way of putting people down or judging. Color matters because we're all uniquely different and to value and appreciate our differences is really what's needed to build respectful relationships. And that might be an area in which we changed a little bit since the time when yep. I was growing up. I, well, one I was... of the things I remember was was when you were a football player at, at, in high school and you invited the four defensive linemen to come over there and all of them were African-Americans. And we just had a wonderful meal together in our home. And I was so proud, 
that you wanted your teammates to come into our home and have a lovely meal together. And that was, a, that to me was a very special evening. So I, I remember that with a lot of fondness. Well, that makes me think that for both of us, the experiences of relationship around racism in some ways are bigger than the, than the stories and the, and the messages that we pass down, which in some cases were very helpful. In other cases, we've learned and we've grown from and, and unhelpful ways we've progressed since then. But, but I really have come to value the relationships that I've had um, and certainly racial relationships across racial lines because of what was modeled uh, with you. Well, I, I am glad to hear that. Um, I, I think at times we all wrestle with what our culture and our country has taught us. And, and this division is deep in our country, deeper than we realize. Um, and yet I do believe that, that building relationships, cross-racial friendships, honest friendships, meeting with people, seeing them as fellow human beings on our journey together and loving and respecting one another is a great anecdote to the to the poison that still is in our world and the hurt and brokenness that still is in our world. I take that very seriously. And I'm, I'm delighted to have this conversation with you. Yeah, I'm thankful for what you've taught me. I'm, I hope you're thankful for the ways in which we've continued to grow and, and I've continued to push you and we'll just, uh, we'll have to keep doing that. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm all for that. You continue to push me and I will maybe once in a while be able to push you too. All right. Thank, thanks for your time, dad. Appreciate you. I love you. Take care, Andrew. Love you too.